So hello everyone, um, I'm Hannah Bendikowski from the Rossing Center. We will start in, in, in a minute. Um, this is a webinar where you cannot actually see the other participant, only the speakers in the panel. So everything is working. Uh, it's a different kind of webinar, um, but we can see you and um, we will start in, in a minute. Uh, during the session, you'll be able to communicate um, with, with us through the chat or through their question and answers. And um, we're very happy to, to see you all with us this evening. So good evening again for those who joined us. Um, we will start in a minute. Um, don't be surprised that you don't see the other participant. It's a different kind of webinar. You can only see the panelists, but we can see you and we're happy that you are here with us. So I think we will start and uh, I guess others will join us. Uh, okay. Okay, it's eight, one past eight. So we, I think we can start. Um, so allow me to welcome you all for our annual lecture in memory of the founder and the first director of the Jerusalem Center for Jewish Christian Relations. I'm Hannah Bendikowski from the Rossing Center for Education and Dialogue. Um, we started 2000, in 2004 um, as the Jerusalem Center for Jewish Christian Relations. And those of you who follow the work of the Rossing Center and the JCJCR know that we changed uh, four years ago, the name, and it's named after the founder and the director, uh, Daniel Rossing. Last year, we commemorated the 10th anniversary um, of uh, the passing away of, of Daniel in a memorable webinar in the midst of the pandemic. It was last December when all of us from all over the world were closed at home, but very close together with each other. I think one of the positive outcome of this pandemic, without forgetting, of course, the many negative aspects and the hundreds of thousands who lost their lives, is that we have learned how to get together in a virtual way and use this technological platform to share thoughts, ideas, and knowledge. And I thank you for being part of that and joining us today. Daniel hoped to develop an initiative that will focus on the unique challenges and advantages of Jewish Christian relations in the Holy Land. His experience in the Ministry of Religions in the educational program of Melitz encouraged him to draw attention to of Israelis and Christians around the world to the local Christian communities, the living stones, the communities who have long heritage and history in the Holy Land since early days of Christianity. I have to admit, as someone who spent a lot of hours in the, uh, in the Christian quarter as part of my work, 
that in this time of pandemic clarified more than ever how the local communities maintain the Christian presence in the Holy Land. They feel the churches during the holidays participate in the services. Without them, the holy places would stay empty. And we definitely felt that during pandemic when they were the ones who were in the services and there were no pilgrims because the borders were closed. It's true that we see more diverse presence of Christians in the Holy Land in the last 20 years, not only Palestinian Christians from Israel and the West Bank, but also Russian Israeli Christians, Christian migrant worker, asylum seekers, and others. In the last few years, I could also notice many Israeli Jews visiting the holy places, especially during weekends. They're doing guided tours, explore by themselves, there's a growing curiosity of Israeli Jews toward Christians and Christianity. They don't always know how and where to study. They don't always have the attitude I think they, would, they should have or I think would be appropriate to have toward Christian and Christianity. But they walk around, they ask questions, and they keep saying, wow, it feels like being abroad. The Margish Chul. In the last few years, we also witnessed more books being published about Jewish Christian dialogue in Israel or about the dialogue from an Israeli perspective, books about Christianity in Hebrew. Just to mention a few, the book Jesus was a Jew presenting Christian and Christianity in Israeli state education that was published by Orik Ramon, Ines Gabel and Varda Wasserman. The book by Karma Ben Yochanan, Jacob Younger Brother, Christian Jewish Relations After Vatican II, that was published last year in Hebrew and will be published in English um, next April. Uh, pa uh, Professor Paula Fredrickson uh, book in Hebrew, Christ When Christian Were Jews, that was just published. And of course, the book we celebrate today that was published in Hebrew 10 years ago and last summer in English edition by Dr. Amnon Ramon, Christian, Christianity and Christians in the Jewish state, Israeli policy toward the churches and Christian communities, 1948 to 2018. It was published by the Jerusalem Institute for Policy Research and the Rossing Center for Education and Dialogue. This evening, um, we are going to explore different aspects related to Jewish Christian relations and church and, and Christian or church and state relations with our distinguished guests and distinguished uh, speakers. And I'm very honored to present them. Um, we will try to be, so there will be um, four presentation and then um, a presentation and, and response by the writer of, uh, of the book we celebrate today by Dr. Amun Ramon. Uh, each speaker will have a short time to present one topic. So it's a bit different from the formal webinars we used to have that we used to have conversation. Now we'll have uh, short lectures and, but we'll get different aspects of, of the topic of Jewish Christian relations, state, um, state, uh, church's relations in the Holy Land. Um, so we will start with uh, Mayan Rave. Mayan um, is a PhD candidate in the Department of Competitive Religions in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a fellow of the PhD honors program in Mandel School for Advanced Studies in Humanities and the Harry Truman Research Institute for the Advanced, uh, Advancement of Peace. Her research focuses on Christian theology in relation to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict on the tension between theology and politics. Uh, Mayan is also active member of several interreligious dialogue and peace organization in Jerusalem and used to work and still very much involved with the Rossing Center work. Almost two years ago, the Danes published a new translation of the Bible without the word Israel. These news, came to the uh, Ynet website, which is a popular Israeli news website, and they dedicated a whole article to the news about the Bible without the word Israel. Mayan will try to explain what could stand behind the decision of making this kind of translation, and especially the reaction in Israel to the publication and how it relates to interfaith and the re relations and the relation between theology and politics. Mayan. So thank you, Prana. I will just share my screen. Okay. Um, so as 
kind of started to say. Um, in April 2020, a news article was published on the Israeli news site Ynet under the headline, Denmark present the Bible without the word Israel. The article, which was published following a similar publication on the Danish news website, has a new translation of the New Testament published in Denmark, in which the word Israel is omitted and replaced by Judaism, Jews, or a reference to humanity in general. The article quotes Jan Frost, who exposed the affair in Denmark and is described as a Bible enthusiast and supporter of Israel. Frost claimed that the old theological expression for this is replacement theology, in which you replace Israel with the church. The news article ends this way, and you can um, Okay, and you can see here both the, the um, article in Ynet and uh, in Time of Israel, which is just translation of the same article. So it's end with a quote, a Bible society representative of Frost that the position was made to avoid confusing the land of Israel with the state of Israel. However, the name of other countries from that time that still exist, such as Egypt, have not been changed. The reaction to the event in Israel immunitated to outrage. They include smart ones, such as something is rotten in the state of Denmark, and those who wonder about the fall of the nation of righteousness. The main argument typically to the Israeli response was, it was an act driven by sheer anti-Semitism. It is interesting to note that in the article itself, the word anti-Semitism does not appear at all. What does appear in is the enforced accusation that this is a return to replacement theology, a claim that for anyone familiar with modern Christian theology yells anti-Semitism. Although I think it's quite safe to say that the average Israeli is not familiar with modern Christian theology. And yet the act of omitting the word Israel is perceived by Israelis as an act based on hatred of Israel. I do not want to elaborate here on the issues of the accuracy of the Israeli allegation. Instead, I would like to try to examine the situation itself and perhaps present a more complex picture, both from the Israeli side and the Danish side, in order to better understand the gaps between the two parties. I suggest that we start with the Danish side and the response of the Danish Bible Society. <clears throat> so here you can see the official response, a part of it. Uh, and I quote, the Contemporary Danish Bible 2020 is a special kind of Bible translation directed at secular readers with no or little knowledge of the Bible and of its history and traditional church and Bible language. This means that many things are translated differently than in traditional Bible translation. For instance, it doesn't use the usual Danish word for sin, grace, mercy, covenant, and many other typical biblical words with an average Danish reader would not be familiar with the meaning of. In the translation of the New Testament, it uses the Jewish people, the Jews, God's chosen people, or simply the people, to translate Israel, since the majority of Danish reader will not would not know that Israel in the New Testament at large refer to the people of God with which he has made a covenant. By omitting the word Israel, Danish Bible society tried to separate the Christian religious message of the New Testament from the political reality in saying that not only is the religious understanding of scripture not conditioned by political reality, but the very connection between the two may lead to misunderstanding by the uneducated reader. In other words, the Danish Bible Society tried to make a simplistic reduction of a very complex matter to the Danish church. And maybe here lies the key to the case at large. The very omission of the word Israel from the Danish translation does not say much about the target audience of the translation, that is, the secular society in Denmark, but about the Danish church itself, which owns the Danish Bible Society. For the Danish church, the connection between the state of Israel and biblical Israel is a complex theological matter, which it has no simple solution, and I will even add, which it does not have the necessary theological tools in order to solve. 
when there are currents within the Church of Denmark to see the state of Israel as a fulfillment of the divine promise. There are others which see Israel's policy and action towards the Palestinian as a sin against God. Thus, the official solution that seeks to separate the religious discourse from the political relay allows the Danish church not to establish an official theological position regarding the religious status of the state of Israel. The act of omitting the word Israel, which most, uh, most would say is radical, stems from the desire of the church of Denmark, or at least um, the Danish Bible Society, to mediate the Bible to the secular reader without revealing these theological complicities. It's important to note that in the attempt of the Danish church to separate the religious from the political relay, there is of course an interference of political motives in the religious one. It is probable that the decision to replace the word Israel was also accompanied by pressure from pro-Palestinian organization within the Danish church. And that is for now from the Danish side. At this point, I want to return to the Israeli response. In this case, what infuriates the Israelis was not particularly the insertion of political ideology into religious discourse. That is quite a common practice. Israeli out outrage was directed at precisely the opposite practice. The suspicious attempt started with meaning to separate political reality from the religious discourse. The very claim that it is possible to detach even if for an instant between modern uh, state of Israel and the biblical text seems outrageous. The reaction of many Israelis to this article and the association between the omitting of the word Israel and European anti-Semitism may seem obvious to many. And still, I suggest that we ponder on this point. After all, not every Christian reading of the Bible is, um, is judged as anti-Semitic. A typological reading of the Bible story may be perceived by many of, uh, in Israel as mistake or even foolishness, but not as anti-Semitism. So does reference to the United States as the promised land or the use of the Exodus story by different groups around the, um, around the world. If so, at this point, a different reading of the Bible by Christian was perceived as anti-Semitic and not as just another misreading. And the answer to this is, I think, quite obvious. The very act of detaching the modern state of Israel from the biblical text seems as an actual, and some would even say existential threat. The separation between the religious and the political pulls the rug from under the Israeli feet, in theory and perhaps also in practice. But here there is an important point to note, which in my opinion constitutes the main gap between the Danish act and the Israeli response. The discourse in Christian theology around the conception of Judaism and replacement theology was never resolved. The main reason for this is, in my understanding, that after the Holocaust, the need and urgency of the Christian world to clear Christian theology from anti-Semitism required a hasty reaction that left many questions unresolved. A big and itching hole in a wisdom tooth of the Christian faith had not undergone a root canal treatment, but rather a temporary feeling. A root canal treatment is a delicate and laborious undertaking, and it was obviously not accomplished. This may explain the need to separate, at least for the time being, the theological question from the political reality. While many Christians in Western world support the establishment of the state of Israel, at the political level, important questions that were posed about the religious meaning of this event remained unresolved and potentially threatening. One may thus argue that the case is not that. Churches argue that the modern state of Israel has nothing to do with biblical Israel, or the other way around, that the Bible has nothing to do with the state of Israel. With no solution at hand, they prefer a policy of ignoring, which does not necessarily amount to rejecting, denouncing, or disproving. At the same time, it is safe to say that most Western churches do reject replacement theology and grabs it as anti-Semitic. Those, unlike the, unlike the Israeli beliefs, failure to treat the state of Israel as a religious issue does not necessarily indicate an anti-Semitic stance. It may point more to a default option rather than a conclusive and negative one. 
Asia is the Israeli Palestinian conflict has often been raised by different churches as well as by economical organizations such as the World Council of Churches. However, it was always discussed on the social, political rather than religious level or as an interlocked issue. One may conclude that while in terms of Israeli perception, any dispute of the connection between the state of Israel and the Bible is perceived as anti-Semitic act, which pose a real threat to Judaism in general and the Jewish nation in particular. In Western Christianity, the theological complexity of the issue led most churches to seek to separate as much as possible between the political reality and the religious discourse. From the Western Church's perspective, I believe the publication of the new translation of the Bible in Denmark indicates a meaningful change. 100 years ago, such a translation would not be put on the agenda or come up for discussion, as there was no theological difficulty in the men mentioning of Israel in the New Testament. 40 years ago, the inflammatory hole that was open at the wisdom tooth of the Christian world prevent touching this sore area relating to Judaism. From the Israeli perspective, the Jewish people has known their own torment and suffering, and they can hardly stand any more of this. So they prefer to cry wolf, even a false alarm than being wrong. The perception in Israel is that the burden of proof in the interfaith dialogue between Judaism and Christianity is on the Christian side. And the discourse is for the most part one way. It is notable that when Christians send theologians to the dialogue table, Israel sent diplomats. It is apparent that the story does not end here, with the continuous occupation of the West Bank and the situation in the Gaza Strip, and the periodic disruption of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There are more voices heard that call the churches to develop an intricate discourse in relation to Judaism in general and Israel in particular. This discourse is supposed to enable a more comprehensive and sophisticated attitude, waving together religious and political argument and meaning. The end result of this process is yet to be seen. If so, the gap between the Israeli society and Western Christianity on the boundaries of discourse and the definition of antisemitism may even be widened. And at this point, we must ask ourselves, Christian and Israeli Jews alike, how do we avoid a situation in which that all important call against anti Semitism will not be lost in translation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayan. Yes, it seems that, yeah, we, we sometimes lose in translation, but in the wider meaning of the word uh, translation, because it could also be not just a translation, literally the translation of the words, but actually understanding um, understanding each other in a more wider uh, meaning of that. So thank you, Mayan, um, for opening the, the discussion. Um, and we will move further north toward the Shafar Am, which is a, a mixed city um, in the Galilee. It's a mixed Arab city with Muslim, Christian, and Druze, if I'm not mistaken about 25% of the population in Shafam are Christians. Um, until the 1920s, there was even a small Jewish community. So it's a city with, uh, with a long history of, of practicing uh, and living in, in coexistence. And we are honored to have Canon Fouad Dara uh, with us today. Father Dara is the rector of the St. Paul Anglican Church in the city of Shafam in the Galilee. And the Canon of Reconciliation and ecumenical and interfaith relations in the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem. He's also a musician and a gospel singer. Um, and being a religious leader for a community, he, you probably have a lot to deal with the state institutions as part of your work. And uh, I will invite Reverend uh, Fouad uh, Dara to share with us some of the, the challenges and the achievements in state church relation in his work. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you, thank you very much. This is a privilege and it's an honor to have this opportunity to share and to bear with each other. Uh, so happy to share, happy to bear one another's burden and that's why we're here. <laughs> now, uh, I would like to um, uh, start by saying that I'm gonna uh, speak or share with you 
more of an experience. Uh, I'm not uh, as academic as you all are, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from my, from my experience as an Arab, uh, Palestinian, Christian, Israeli, Anglican, living in the state of Israel. So when we speak of these um, uh, uh, five uh, ingredients of the identity, uh, it confuses so many people uh, when they hear the word Arab, Christian, Palestinian, Anglican, Israeli, uh, living in Israel. Now, uh, uh, which, which, which uh, uh, says that uh, the question of identity to start with is one of the most important issues as far as I'm concerned and the uh, people whom I serve uh, are mainly concerned. Speaking of an Arab, uh, uh, of course, uh, for so many people around the world uh, is related always to Islam and Muslims, uh, which makes it more difficult and challenging for us to convince people that we are Arab Christians since the very uh, first Pentecost. Uh, we are not new converts as being Arabs, and Christians, we were there in the very first Pentecost, which took place in Jerusalem uh, 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 in the uh, 2000 and so years. Uh, we were there, many, many, many Christians, European Christians were not there. We Arabs were there in the very first Pentecost. So we trace back our origins as Christians uh, in this part of the world to the very first Pentecost, as I said. Now, uh, being a Palestinian Arab, uh, is also uh, an important ingredient of my identity because we are uh, a continuation of the Palestinian uh, heritage and culture uh, of this of this of this part of the world. Uh, of course, uh, many Arab Israelis, Christians, Palestinians uh, would not use the word Palestinian, but we as a church we do we do stress and we do. Uh, emphasize our Palestinian uh, heritage and culture and history with the larger Palestinian people who are living in the West Bank as well as in Israel and in the diaspora. Now, being an Israeli uh, is also uh, part of the identity because all those Arab Palestinian Christians as well as Muslims who continue to live in the state of Israel after 1948, mainly after the creation of the state of Israel, have become automatically citizens of the state of Israel. Uh, being an Israeli does not mean being a Jew. Uh, as, 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 as much as being an Arab does not mean being a Muslim. Uh, now, uh, being an Anglican, that does not mean I'm a British because the word Anglican also is related to uh, England. So an Arab, but not a Muslim, a Christian, but not a new convert, a Palestinian, but not a terrorist, uh, uh, an Israeli, but not a Jew, an Anglican, but not British. But that's who we are. So the question of identity in, 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 uh, in, our, in our circles uh, is very important. Now, uh, the, the, the church, of course, uh, faces uh, lots of challenges. Of course, uh, we are a church spread all, all over uh, uh, um, the, the, the Middle East, not only in Israel, but also Israel, the occupied territories, uh, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and elsewhere. But I'm talking as a diocese of Jerusalem, uh, as an Episcopal Anglican uh, priest. Uh, of course, uh, as you mentioned uh, in your introduction, we are a church which also uh, embraces and runs lots of institutions. Uh, and many, many churches around, around, around this area. Uh, of course, uh, the, the uh, work of the institutions in our diocese is very challenging when it comes mainly uh, to schools and other uh, institutions which are run by the church. Uh, of course, um, uh, being a citizen of the state of Israel, now, no matter whether I'm, an, I'm in a Muslim or a Christian, uh, of course, but as an Arab, uh, we have felt and still feel that we are not treated as, as, as first class citizens, if not second or third class citizens. Now, uh, this also 
sheds a light on the work of our schools and institutions when it comes to budgets, with, when, when it comes uh, to support by the state of Israel or the Ministry of Education, when, when it comes to school and many other institutions. This is a challenge for the church, of course, uh, uh, and, and people have to know that uh, we, we, we have exist, existed as a church, as I said in the beginning, before the creation of the state of Israel. Now, uh, we continue to serve, we continue to work, uh, despite all the challenges uh, we face, despite all the difficulties we, 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 we face as, uh, as a church. Now, uh, of course, the church have always and will continue to uh, try to find uh, the right speech, as it were, uh, when it comes with the state of Israel. Uh, uh, this, the, the, the church have always uh, uh, stated that we are uh, a church which has to build bridges, which have to uh, also work hand in hand with the uh, 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 civil society of the state of Israel, as well as with all the uh, governmental political um, uh, uh, levels. Therefore, we are not a church which is uh, uh, not part of the society. We are part and parcel of the society where we live, where we exist, where we serve. Now, uh, uh, yes, the church uh, have initiated uh, so many dialogues. Uh, our church uh, as an Anglicans uh, have really worked and still working on, on, on building bridges and opening dialogues with the Muslim community as well as with the Druze community and with the uh, Jewish community. And we do have lots of uh, uh, events and, and uh, 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 nice uh, work uh, between, between different faith uh, uh, communities. Talking about Shfaram or Shafamar, uh, we are a city, as you did say in the beginning, uh, with, with, with uh, Muslims and Christians and Druze. And historically speaking, we had, yes, a Jewish community. And up to today, uh, there is one of the historical Jewish synagogues, uh, which is very, very well taken care of in the city of Shafamar. Uh, we are, uh, we are uh, 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 a city where uh, the Muslims, Christians, and Druze, in, 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 in relationship with our neighbors, uh, uh, the Jewish communities of Hardov and Adi and other places have, have, uh, do come together uh, uh, more than once a year for different kinds of program. Only three weeks ago, I've welcomed uh, the Jewish choir of the uh, Hardov and Adi um, uh, kibbutz uh, to sing in our church. Uh, and they do come every year uh, for such an event, preparing for Christmas, uh, and where we invite also the parents of the, of the um, uh, kids, whether from the Jewish community as well as from the Christian community, to meet afterwards and to get to know each other. Um, uh, it, might looks, uh, it might look that these are small things, but I think, and I believe, and I'm convinced that it starts there. It starts with, 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 with these small things, with these small events and uh, initiatives. Um, and again, um, uh, as a Christian, I see myself and I see my mission as, as, as a bridge builder, as a communicator, as a facilitator. And that's how the church sees itself as, as well. Therefore, um, uh, uh, the, the relationship with the state of Israel is 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 a, uh, is an important issue and, and 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 an important item. We are very we are very um, uh, clear with 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 the state of Israel when it comes to issues of identity, of uh, 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 of, of of rights to our schools, to our institutions, to our hospitals, uh, and of course uh, um, the the uh, the state of Israel have have not always, as I said, treated us uh, uh, as first class citizens, uh, no matter whether we are Muslims or Christians or Druze or whatever, but uh, this, is, this is a struggle, uh, which is an ongoing struggle uh, for us as, as, as Christians uh, and as minority, within a minority in the state of Israel. 
um, but again, uh, what, what concerns me is the uh, younger generations. What concerns us as a church uh, are the young people. Uh, we need to, and we always try to seek and to work and to find ways in which uh, we could really build a stronger sense of belonging, especially among young people, uh, to their land, to their history, and to their uh, Christian heritage. Uh, many, 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 many of our families, many young people have, have, have immigrated and uh, still think of immigration because of the political and social and economical uh, uh, challenges. Of course, uh, uh, talking about young people, we have to talk about job opportunities, housing projects, uh, 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 and many other issues, uh, which the church has to take care of. But I think uh, this is also the responsibility of the state, the responsibility uh, of, our, of our government also to, to help us in, 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 in finding those uh, opportunities for our young people. Uh, for our young families, for our young couples, uh, in order to stay and not to leave. Uh, talking about the Christian community in, in, in Israel, as you all know, and you know much better than me, that we hardly make 1.5%, if not less or more, of the population, which is a very serious number. Uh, and as I keep saying and telling our, our Christian uh, brothers and sisters from all over the world, if the situation will continue to the way it is, with all the challenges politically and socially and economically, in, 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 in a short period of time, our churches will become museums. Our churches uh, uh, will become uh, shrines uh, with, no, with, no, with, with no people. And when we speak of, of, of the church, we don't speak only uh, of buildings, we speak of living stones. Uh, we make the place holy. It's not the place which makes the people holy. We make those places holy. We make the, uh, the, the, the land where we live uh, holy. And don't believe in holy places as much as I believe in holy people who make the places uh, uh, important. Uh, therefore, uh, despite the number, uh, we, 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 we feel and we believe uh, wholeheartedly that we have a mission. Uh, to our people, uh, we have to be a voice, a voice for peace, a voice for reconciliation, uh, uh, um, a crying voice in this wilderness of our world in which we live. Uh, but again, uh, I, I, I would like to um, thank you for letting me sharing this experience of mine. And I hope that I will be uh, also uh, ready to answer any question or any uh, thing which comes uh, on your screens uh, by the people who are following with all of us. Uh, thank you and bless you all. Thank you very much, Ken Fouadarer. Um, I think what is a bit different from uh, in, in, in Israel um, for the Jewish and the Muslim community and the Christian community, that the Christian community actually, the, Christian, the churches actually do a lot of services that we used to receive from the state, like education, and social services and housing project, um, which the majority of Israelis receive from the state. And since the church is giving so many services, the, the collaboration between the state and the church um, should be more smooth and, and mm. should be more cooperative. Um, and, and this struggle to maintain your rights is, is definitely an important one. Uh, just remember five years ago with with the school system, the schools of the churches that uh, want to receive the proper funding in order to continue and educate tens of thousands of Israeli citizens, Muslims, Christians, Palestinians. Um, so definitely it's an important thing. Um, there was a, a question again about Shafel Ab. So it's in the Galilee in the north of Israel and uh, of the Holy Land and of Israel. And the percentage of Christians in Israel is less than 2%. There are about 175,000 Christians in Israel. Among them, 80% are Arab speakers, Palestinians. Mm. I mean, you, you've mentioned the question of the identity and how you define yourself, but um, 80%, so about 135,000 Arab speaking Christians in Israel, which is a little bit more than 1%, and, and it's mm. a very small community. In, in Israel. Thank you very much, uh, Father Daraya. Um, 
Well, for those of you who are familiar with the Jewish Christian world, I don't have to introduce Dr. Debbie Weissman. Um, she has years of experience and involvement in interfaith by serving even two terms as the first Jewish woman president of the International Council of Christian and Jews, which is, I think, the first interfaith or Jewish Christian organization uh, that was established in Germany after the Second World War uh, and published many documents and still very much involved in that. And, and Debbie is still, Dr. Weissman is still uh, very much involved with and, and consulting the organization. She's an educator, activist in peace movement. She's a feminist, founder of an orthodox pluralistic community in Jerusalem, the Yadidia Synagogue. And lately, she is the author of a book of her memories, Memories of a Hopeful Pessimist. I just love the name of the book. A Life of Activism Through Dialogue. She published it a year and a half ago. And um, since Dr. Weisman has a lot of experience in international interfaith uh, dialogue, um, she would talk about the local Jewish Christian dialogue with Arab Palestinians in Israel and in the West Bank and the unique challenges and how it reflects the contextualization of the dialogue um, in comparing to the Western dialogue. She'll talk about stereotypes, prejudice, ignorance, and hopefully we'll say a few words of hope and how um, it can be developed. Please. Yeah, I always forget to unmute. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. You know that when um, you begin a talk, the rabbis of the Talmud taught that we should begin with two things. The first thing is praise for the setting, Sheva Chachsanya, and the other is Inyane Dioma, which means current events, current affairs. So I will definitely praise the Achsanya of the Rossing Center. I personally learned a great deal from Daniel Rossing, and I continue to admire and sometimes participate in the work that goes on. I thought Amnon's book was wonderful. I recommend it to everybody. And of course, I've enjoyed many hours of touring with Hana. Um, so that's my praise for the Rossing Center. As far as current events, I want to mention three things. Number one, tomorrow is International Human Rights Day. And I think that part of our discussion is about human rights and the right of people from the entire religious spectrum to have freedom of worship and freedom of movement. And unfortunately, Christians are not always permitted to attend worship services and visit their holy sites. And I think that's a human rights issue. Secondly, for the Christians on the panel and in the audience, we're in the midst of Advent, which is the season that leads us into the Christmas holidays. And I wish all of you a very happy holiday season. And finally, for the Jews, we're um, going to read this Shabbat, Parshat Vayigash, which is about reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers. And that reminds me of um, the Pope who visited a synagogue, I think it was John Paul II, and said that Jews are the elder brothers of Christians. So we're talking about reconciliation of brothers and sisters, of course. Okay. Um, it is true that for many years I've been involved in interreligious dialogue. But it's only in the last 10 or 12 years that I really became aware of the differences between the international Christian community, at least as represented through the Catholic Church and the World Council of Churches and other such organizations and the local Palestinian Christian experience. And I think those are very different. I'm going to be relating to the difference. First of all, I want to say about the local Christians that they do represent a very wide and colorful spectrum of Christianity, including many churches that when I lived in the West and I moved here in 1972, but I wasn't familiar with 
the many, many um, types of Orthodox Christians, Eastern churches, and so on. And I think that that's something that really adds to the uh, beauty of living here, the diversity, the religious, cultural, linguistic diversity. Um, and I think that certainly the Armenians are very close to us in the sense that they are both a religious and an ethnic identity. And I think you see that in some of the other churches here as well. Now, um, Canon uh, Fouad mentioned that there's a lot of ignorance out there and there are people who really should know better but think that Palestinian means Muslim. And I, 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 I've had to actually probably more experience in dialogue with local Christians than in dialogue with local Muslims, which is a bit strange given the percentages within the population. Muslims are a much larger group, but I think perhaps because of my base in Jerusalem and my connections with the churches, I've come in contact with a lot of local Christians. And I think it's very important for local Jews to know about local Christians. And I'm pleased to hear from Hannah that there's curiosity because my experience, I was going to say something that a small group within the Jewish community, not only did they not have curiosity, but they actually have hostility towards Christians. And I think this is a, a terrible problem. It's a small problem, but it is a problem that gives us a sense of shame uh, when a church is burned or vandalized, or when a human being is spat upon because he's wearing a cross or he's in um, some kind of religious garb. And that has happened. And I, I say that as Jews, we have to take responsibility for our ignorance, our indifference, and the small group of Jews who are openly hostile. Um, so I'm critical of us as Jews, but now I'm going to say some remarks that might be considered critical of Christians. I just wanted you to see that I'm, if there's enough criticism to go around for many groups. And, um, and I'm generalizing, and obviously there are exceptions. And certainly when I spoke about ignorance, certainly we have just on the screen several Jews who know a great deal about local Christians. So, but I think that we, uh, if I can include myself, we are the exceptions. I think the general rule is that Israeli Jews know very little about Christianity. And until they start uh, visiting places with Amnon or Hano or Orit or others, um, what they know about Christianity is generally from American television programs. There's a, every series has a, Chris, a Christmas episode. So that's what they know about. Okay. Um, what I want to criticize about the local Christians is that topics that we deal with in Christian Jewish dialogue throughout the world, for example, the Jewishness of Jesus, for example, the Jewish roots of Christianity, these topics are foreign to the local Christians and they are at best indifferent and sometimes even negative. Now I understand why they're living in a totally different context. In most countries of the world, if there is a Jewish community that's legal, it's a minority. And the majority culture is either Muslim or in the Western world, generally Christian or post-Christian. We are the only country in the world where the majority are Jews. And we are not only the state of Israel, but the territories in which we are an occupying power. And so therefore, local Christians, whether they live as citizens of Israel or they live as Palestinians, say on the West Bank, um, they do not see Jews as a minority that should be protected. They, they need protection from what they perceive of as 
the oppression by the majority culture. And so it, ma it makes our dialogue generally less religious or less theological. We don't talk about replacement theology or supersessionism. Or, we generally talk about the political context. And I think that that's unfortunate. I would like us to be able, at least theoretically, in dialogue, to separate the contextual political questions from the religious and theological and textual questions. And you know what Mayan was saying, I know a, an Israeli Christian cleric who says that he has a lot of trouble in his community within Israel using texts from what Christians call the Old Testament because they keep talking about Israel. So it isn't only in Denmark that they have this issue, it's definitely right here. And we have tried within the ICCJ, the International Council of Christians and Jews, to run dialogues with local uh, Palestinian Christians. And we have found that sometimes there's this feeling, well, you in the West have all your guilt from centuries of anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism, and especially the Holocaust, the Shoah, don't put that guilt on us. Here, we are the ones who are suffering, and um, you deal with your own problems. And this is a big issue because very often, the people who sponsor and support these dialogues are German Christians. So perhaps some of them are motivated, I would say not guilt, but a sense of national responsibility. Many of them are way too young to have even been alive during the Second World War. And they are um, very positive about dialogue with Jews. And they have tried sometimes, I mean, just a few weeks ago, we had a, a dialogue workshop with local uh, Palestinian Christians, local Israeli Jews, and lots of Germans and a few other people from other parts of the world. It can be a very fruitful dialogue, but I think that um, there should be what I would call not just inter-religious dialogue, but intra-religious. In other words, I think Western Christians who have a new approach to dialogue with Jews, I would hope that they could be influential with their colleagues in Palestine, in Israel, in the, in the Middle East. And uh, they have also issues about how uh, other Middle Eastern countries have treated their own Christian communities. I think it's a very big issue, uh, for example, in some of our surrounding countries. And, and I, I wish them well. I think that's a task, a very important task. But I think that we also, as Jews, have to do our own homework and educate ourselves and our fellow Jews about the fact that Israel is a sovereign state where the Jews are the majority, and therefore we have a special responsibility as to how we treat our minority groups. I think, for me, that's maybe the essence of Zionism, the idea of sovereignty with responsibility. And unfortunately, many of my fellow Israelis who consider themselves Zionists don't see it at all that way. And um, as I say, some of them make life miserable for Christians and others are just simply ignorant and indifferent. I'm happy that more and more are curious I wish they would uh, take some of the courses that the Rossing Center provides. And I hope that perhaps the next time we have this kind of a conversation, we can be not so pessimistic, but more hopeful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Debbie. Well, you actually really promote the work of the Rossing Center. <laughs> so great. We, we, we happy to continue to work with you really for, for for all these years since the establishment of the organization, you were part of that. Um, I would go back to what you said in the beginning and you talked about ignorance and indifference. And I think ignorance is one thing. And as I said, there is growing curiosity 
I wanted to present a more optimistic view. Yes, there are a lot of other problems, but I think the, the big problem is indifference. It's not just the people don't know, it's that they don't care. And, and this is, that's what I meant when I said that, well, there's interest, but there's the, the attitude is not the right <laughs> attitude. And, and definitely we have to work on that. So thank you very much for your words. Um, and, and going d deeper to the real, you know, one of the, one of the main issues and problems in, in state church or state Christians relations um, would be in our next presentation. Um, when the nation state bill was published three and a half years ago, uh, many of my Christians, um, friends and acquaintance uh, said that it was a turning point of their relation with the, with the state. And I would like to invite Professor Selim Unaya, who will try to explain why it was such a turning point and in what way it made a difference. So Professor Munaya is an executive director and founder of the Musalaha Ministry of Reconciliation, which has been bringing Israelis and Palestinians together since 1990. And, um, create, and it's creating a forum for reconciliation. Selim serves as an academic, he served as an academic dean and professor at the Bethlehem Bible College uh, from 1989 till 2008 and still teaches um, at, the, um, at the college. And he's also teaching in a different academic institution and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Please, Salim. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Hannah. And I appreciate uh, very much. Can you hear me, please? Yeah, okay, great. Well, um, also Mabruk to Ramon, I remember you, more than 10 years ago, we met together and we talked about your book and you present your finding. So continue to do the, the good job. And of course, uh, Mayan, we sat and talked quite a bit on your MA thesis. Um, what I would like to do uh, here, uh, talk about our subject of Christianity and do I, I need to do share, of course, first. Share screen, and here we are. Can you see it? Excellent, excellent. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to uh, say a few things that Daniel and I, we spent a lot of hours with Hannah traveling around the country, speaking different school to teachers. And so we, I was in the beginning quite a bit with the beginning of the, the Jerusalem Center before the Dana Rossing Center. And we talked a lot about our relay, uh, what's his vision and dream. And uh, he has several uh, points that I would like to raise. One of them that he was very much concerned that the Western Christian Jewish conversation over uh, shadows the local context of the relationship between uh, Jews and Christian. And also it has been mentioned quite a bit in the different uh, speakers, the lack of knowledge of Christianity and local Christian among Israeli Jewish population. And he was already beginning to be very much concerned with a larger uh, hostility that outspoken right now by a segment of rabbinical Jews. And uh, that is as, uh, had been talked about burning churches, attack on clergy and places. And also as Karma in his book talked about uh, that in many uh, places, Christianity have changed its attitude to Jews and Judaism set of Israel, but <clears throat> the reverse is with major segment of um, rabbinical Judaism. And I hear our saying that yes, there is ignorance, but also there is growing. Uh, hostility toward Christianity that openly it was maybe hidden now it's openly and he sees after previous uh, uh, after this, as the previous speaker said that the test of Israel as a sovereign state is a treatment of Christian in the land so what I would like to um, <clears throat> talk about nation state law what I would like for some of the readers that don't know, I'll read just a few paragraphs and why it's alarming and why we am presenting it. The land of Israel is a historical homeland of the Jewish people in which the state of Israel was established. 
Number B, the state of Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people in which it realized its natural, cultural, religious, and historical right of self-determination. The exercise of right of to national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people and so on and so on. So for, for, for many, many Christians, and uh, I'll talk about Christian, not only Palestinian, uh, that is uh, a problematic. So, um, and I would like to highlight several issues that are problematic with it, especially as a Christian, as Palestinian Christian citizen of the state of Israel. Then I'll uh, look a little bit on local Christian responses, the church leadership and the community. That when we talk about the land of Israel as the homeland of the Jewish people only, exclude Palestinian, Palestinian Christian historical, religious and ethnic attachment to the land. We see ourselves as part of the early church in its uh, rich, different ethnic group that lived in the land, Jews, Arabs, Samaritan, Greek, and, and many people that lived in the land that we came out of that part. This is the land where Jesus born, the born in Bethlehem, we're going to celebrate Christmas. He grew up in Nazareth. He was crucified in Jerusalem and the tomb is empty. For us, the land is not like any other land. For us, the land is a fifth gospel. For us, the people that live in this land and the danger of existence as Canon Fouad spoke, it's really alarming because we see the local Christian as a universal witness that in this land is the land of the father, is the land of the prophet. It's the land where Jesus born, grew, ministered, healed, crucified, and raised, risen. So for us, the connection to the land, excluding us from being uh, our connection, belonging, our theological uh, in expression and belonging to the land is, is very, very, very much in danger. And we see it as threatening to us. And also the law then, the nation law said that Jerusalem complete and united is a state of the capital, is a state of the Jewish people. So what are the status of other groups and the future of peace? That all the time in different conversation that we had, concerning future peace, or con we talked about Jerusalem as a inclusive and embracing and honoring our people view of the land. And Jerusalem for us, it's not a political capital for us, Jerusalem, it's a place where Jesus been crucified, is a place who's risen. And uh, so for us, Jerusalem, and attachment to Jerusalem, belonging to Jerusalem, and what Jerusalem speak to Palestinian Christian, and we see it in every uh, Easter, Pascha, the thousands of Christians that coming into Jerusalem, and rightly so, uh, has been mentioned that many Christian, Palestinian Christians from the territory cannot come to Jerusalem, even if the Palestinian citizens of Israel, when they want to come to church, now they are blocked by the police. It is really uh, an issue for us that we see it as, uh, as a threat. We see it as a threat for our root, our belonging, and our proclamation who we are and what we are proclaiming to the rest of the world about the good news of Jesus. So it's very important. Also, uh, what we see here in the nation, nation law is that there is more uh, allowance for halakha, for Jewish law to be part, integral part of legal law. And as a citizen of the state of Israel, as a Palestinian Christian, I see a, a problem because there is many legal issue in the halakha that, for, that relate to non-Jews that it is problematic, it's negative. And we heard already, like in the past, Rav Ovadi Yosef, the chief uh, Sephardi uh, uh, rabbi, um, that he was one of the founders of Shas party, that Christians, because they're not considered 
as worshiping one God, the Aramaic fact of De Kohavim, that they are worshiping of stars, I mean, they're heretics, not heretic, even more than that, they don't have the right to live in Jerusalem. And so, uh, so that is also a very, very problematic that every aspect of any law that we need to understand that the nation law is the ground in the future, legal decision on many issues will be decided by the courts, by the parliament, the Knesset and other area. And here I put several issues that already is the Center for Democracy in Israel uh, should uh, and concern that those issues are going to uh, be, uh, be limited uh, or not having the ability, for example, in the area of freedom of expression. If the land of Israel or religious freedom, if the land of Israel, only for Jewish people, if you challenge or you speak about that, that's going to be a problem. Social right, a social group, legal right, minority right, Equality in education, already we heard about the discrimination toward Palestinian schools in Israel in general, also the problem that the Christian school in Israel, when they are privately uh, mostly um, sponsored by the parents and the church, and the, the government uh, recently is trying to squeeze the church school where here the church schools is one of the things that brings the, the Palestinian Christian community on, on, together. But not only when we talk about education, when we talk about education, we're talking about, about the historical narrative of the Christian in the land, our roots in the land, our belonging to the land, and all our identities very much connected here. So there are very many areas that we have here, challenges that the law uh, has specifically to the rest of the non-Jewish community in Israel, but also specifically in many areas to the Christians, the community. What's happened uh, in this uh, year, it's in May, the, the combination of the nation state law and May events have really shaken the, especially the Palestinian Christian community and kind of awakening it to the, not only the ongoing conflict that we do have between the Palestinian people and the Israeli Jews and the conflict with Gaza and what happened in Sheikh Jarrah and other places where Palestinian sites are being uh, kind of Palestinian Christian sites or places are being moved, the Palestinians being moved and Jewish people are being coming to live in. And that's also in areas like Jaffa Gate, the issue of uh, property of the Orthodox Church and other places that is uh, really uh, posing a lot of challenge for the local Christian community. So I would like to talk about uh, several things, how the church uh, leadership, on church leadership level, how they responded. Sadly to say, it was a very little response to both events publicly. Privately, there was a lot of talk. Privately, church leaders talking about that, but I, uh, as far as I remember, the Catholic Church has mentioned something about that, but we don't have vocal, coherent response from the church leaders to the uh, to the May events, to the uh, and also to the nation uh, state event, and also what we see when I talk to people in the community, they they see this lack of response as uh, or not responding to it publicly, as not giving leadership and pastoral care for the community and the community looking for the church leadership, the church establishment and asking, so what's next? How are we responding? What is our position? What's going on? And that there is a self-critical uh, of our church leadership. And so there's confusion how to respond to the new realities. 
and fear of hurting church position. If we're going to, um, first of all, if we're going to respond, what will be the reaction from the state? Are they going to take some of our rights, some of our privilege that already under threat like visa uh, for clergy and so on. So there are many issues, but there is a new reality. The reality that we're moving in, it is the reality from uh, uh, classical as it was in the past has been perceived by many people. The classical national struggle, it's becoming more religious one. So, and it, uh, the conflict having more, and more religious cause. So what we do with it, how we respond to it, what, how we address it as a Christian community and church leadership. So what happened to the community, the average people, the average people, uh, that we meet at homes and we talk about uh, a situation. There is confusion and increased sense of lack of security. Uh, I'm originally from Lod, Lida, and, and when I talk to people there, I talk to my family, not only that we do have quite a bit of violence in the Arab community of uh, Palestinian Arab community in Israel, and also in the mixed city, suddenly the violence coming from several direction, including that uh, the Garanim, Toranim that been placed in the city. That's mean a group of settlers, religious uh, settler that have moved to live in the midst of the mixed city, in the midst of the Arab Palestinian community in like in Lud, Ramli, Jeff and, and Haifa and other places, Akko. And there was quite a bit of clashes and sense that you lose the security and you lose the protection of the police from, every, from threat that coming from different direction. In recent research that I have done and on Christian identity, Palestinian Christian identity in Israel, that was my uh, doctor thesis many years ago that I, every 10 years, I uh, do and administer the, the questionnaires and asking, a lot of questions. If in the 80 and in the 90s, the Palestinian Arab city, Christian Arab city in Israel were choosing more integration into the Israeli society, seeing the Israeli society are more Western, more, more a secular. And we see a process where the Palestinian Christian society in Israel are not perceiving any more the uh, Jewish society of that is uh, Western society, democratic society, they perceive it more as religious. And as a result, and that is not good in response to uh, what's happening is that more and more Palestinian Christian citizens of the state of Israel are choosing separation. And we need to understand that the Palestinian is Christians in Israel, they are one of the most educated Arab Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel. You see them in university. They are uh, uh, peacekeeping, they keep the law, uh, but they are really finding themselves that they are they having to choose separation. And this separation ghetto mentality is also reflect the fact that church leadership and the leadership of the Palestinian Christian community in Israel have not responded. Like, I, you know, this is argument and fight between the Jews and Muslims. We don't want to be part of it. And that is a big mistake of that, of the community and the leadership. And there is increasingly sense of alienation and marginalization uh, in uh, discrimination in the school, discrimination in places of living, discrimination in in building uh, new homes and society. So the sense of alienation and marginalization increase. Also at the same time, all of that is happening. We see among the young people a reaction. If in the past, we see the Palestinian citizen of Israel in their civil identity, there is increase of Israelization, but at the same time increase of their ethnicity as Palestinian. In the Palestinian Christian community, I see a process that have two folds. One of them, more interest in the Christian identity of the Palestinian population. You see people in, uh, in mixed cities that before 
didn't want to uh, study uh, Christianity or they thought to be more secular, they are turning and asking for more Bible study to know their Christian heritage, to celebrate their Christian heritage. And we see that especially with a larger number of people coming to St. George celebration uh, and the scouts and all of that larger number of people going down, going to those events. So you have the religious aspect is increasing, but also the ethnicity. Also, there are two uh, situations that really great concern for us, and I'm happy that Karen flagged this here, is a widening gap between the church leadership and the young people. Young people are educated, young people are very active in social media, young people are concerned about injustice, and young people are not happy and satisfied with the current position of church leadership and their engagement with the social, political, economic situation. And yes, uh, in the 80, in the 90s, and even the, during the first intifada, second intifada, and other places, church leadership had very clear voices. And right now we don't have it. And our young people are asking these questions and the young people are very educated, very aware, and very much rooted in the context of the situation and alarm with the future. And as a result, we see some people that I sit and talk and saying, well, I'm going to buy a house in Greece, in Athens. If something wrong will happen, I have a place to run to. The, the thought, the talk about leaving the country in the Ukraine increase. So uh, that is the lack of a very clear Christian voice in the situation. Last reflection, the recent event in May have increased the feeling of insecurity among Christians in Israel and affect also interreligious dialogue and all the discussions that we have between the different groups of people in the land. So here, the, the Palestinian Christian, uh, they're not only Palestinian, they are Christian and they sing this aspect of the conflict that moving that is present to them a real a threat and danger for their being, existence and belonging and identity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Munayo. Um, indeed, uh, Reverend Fouad talked about uh, having um, equal rights as citizen and how Christians feel like second class, but now with the nation state bill, you mentioned that uh, you, the concern that uh, even this these rights are um, in erosion and it's not clear that the feeling of insecurity is really influencing and impacting uh, the young generation. The concern for the young generation is, was heard also in your both presentation. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting if I compare to what Debbie said, you call for intra uh, work um, for, your, for the leader of the Christian community as Debbie was talking to the uh, to the leaders of the Jewish community. And I think there's a lot of work to be done within our communities before we coming together uh, for, for dialogue with each other. Um, and last but not least is the author of the book that we're launching and celebrating today, Christianity and Christians in the Jewish State, Israeli Policy Toward the Churches and Christian Communities, 1948 to 2018. And I think um, every time uh, we'll, uh, Amnon would publish a new edition, there will be more things to add and new problems and new issues. Um, Dr. Amnon Ramon is a senior researcher at the Jerusalem Institute for Policy Research, and he researches issues as the activities of the churches and the communities in the Holy Land, the Christian communities in the Holy Land. Uh, the state of Israel, the churches and the Jerusalem question, the Temple Mount from the Jewish point of view, the historical basin of the of Jerusalem and the holy sites, East Jerusalem population, uh, the city boundaries, security fence, Jerusalem metropolis, pilgrimage, tourism in Jerusalem and many other uh, topic. Uh, Am Amnon Ramon is also deputy director of the Institute for Research um, on Eretz Israel in y of Yad Ben Zvi Institute and a lecturer in different academic institutions. And um, Amnon dealt for many years in the relation, and researcher for many years, the relation between the state and the churches. Actually, his PhD was written 
about this topic and was expanded in, in this book. And um, like uh, Debbie and Salim and Mayan is a good friend of the Rossing Center and very much involved in our work for many, many years and also with Daniel in the past. And we're very happy to launch this book. It's the second launching that we're doing together with the Jerusalem Institute for Policy Research. Um, because this, with the, with the English edition of the book, we actually bring this information, not only to the Hebrew speaking audience, but also to the international community. So please, Amnon, your perspective and maybe conclude the discussion. And if you have remarks of what was said, we'll be very happy to hear that. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, you can hear me well because I have a little bit problems with the internet. Okay, everything is okay, okay. Okay, so first uh, I want uh, to start the lecture with words of thanks. Thanks to the Rossing Center for the close partnership that enables the publication of the book in Hebrew and now in English. I remember sitting with Daniel Rossing. He, he was really... He read the Hebrew version and gave me a lot of remarks and, and, and it was a very fruitful dialogue uh, with, uh, with late Daniel. A special thanks to Dr. Sarah Bernstein, the center director, and of course to Hannah, the moderator of this, of this uh, evening. Thanks to Shaul Vardi, the book's translator, to Amy Erani, the designer, to Mark Schulman, the director of the Israeli Academic Press who published the book, and to my friend Professor Yitzhak Reiter who encouraged me all the way, it was a long way. Last but not least, I want to thank the Jerusalem Institute for Policy Research, my academic home, that allows me to reach and write the book as well as others. And now to my short lecture. Uh, Professor Israel Yuval, a historian of uh, Jewish-Christian relations in the Middle Ages, wrote that the historical conflict between Judaism and Christianity ended in 1948 with the establishment of the State of Israel. But, as we learned this evening, the conflict between the two religions did not end in 1948 or even in 1993 after the signing of the fundamental agreement between Israel and the Holy See, which was supposed to regulate the relationship with the Catholic Church and also the other churches in some field. My book, which deals with the complex relations between the Jewish state, the churches and the Christian communities in the Holy Land, was published in Hebrew in 2012. Let's take a look at what has happened since then from the visit of Pope Francis to the Holy Land in May 2014 until today, while focusing mainly on the Jewish-Israeli side. Let's start the journey. Okay, so I'll start with the presentation. Okay, is it okay? Yeah, everything is okay. You can see the presentation. Yes. Okay. So I will I will start with the with the Pope Francis visit to, to the Holy Land. Um, it was initiated by the Ecumenical Patriarchal Bartolomeo the first, uh, fifty years after the. New meeting of, uh, of uh, Paulus uh, the sixth and uh, uh, the ecumenical uh, patriarch uh, at Nagoras uh, in 1964. Uh, the purpose was to act, uh, to bring the two churches closer to one another, or even to act to unite the churches, even it's a very long uh, goal. Uh, but from the Israeli point of view, one of the main uh, themes before the visit was the uh, affair of uh, Mount Zion, uh, King David's tomb, and the Cenaculum on the or the Cenacle on the second floor. And you can see here the poster: King David's tomb is in danger. Stop the agreement between the Vatican. Uh, the, so there were all kinds of rumors that. The government 
uh, during the visit, uh, the prime minister will give back uh, the tomb of David to the Pope. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, tension. Here you can see some of the inscriptions uh, on the walls of Jerusalem. Mavet la'aravim ve la'amutzrim ve lechol sonei Yisrael, death to the Arabs and the Christians and all the enemies of Israel. And, uh, and, uh, and what, and, and some, some, something about uh, Jesus. Uh, uh, very, very tense uh, atmosphere. Uh, 150 people were in the tomb of David, uh, and there were the protests and, and, and demonstrations. When the Pope came to Jerusalem, it seems a little bit more peaceful. Here you can see the welcoming in Jerusalem. Uh, you can see the Pope is the mayor of Jerusalem, Nir Barkat, and uh, some uh, Israeli Jewish uh, uh, children around him with the Holy See flags and the Israeli flag. And you see from the helicopter, you can see the, the, uh, the, the, the soldiers around him. Seems uh, very peaceful, and of course the 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 summit uh, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is between the Patriarch Bartolomeo uh, and and the, and 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 the Pope, which from a Christian point of view and from Catholic point of view and from Orthodox point of view, this was the aim uh, of the visit. Uh, Pope Francis exciting visit to the Western Wall. Uh, it seems like a dream. You can see here uh, the Pope with uh, Rabbi Avraham Skorka from uh, Buenos Aires, his friend, uh, and the uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Omar Aboud, also from Buenos Aires, and they are uh, in, in, the, in embracing one another uh, in, the, in the Western world. <laughs> uh, so this was, it, was, it was like, it, in, in a way, it was like a dream. Uh, and then the Pope uh, came to Mount Herzl, uh, where he laid the flowers on the grave of the seer of the state, Theodor Herzl, 100, 110 years after the disappointing meeting between Herzl and the Pope, uh, Pius uh, the, the 10th. Uh, so it was like, uh, you know, uh, a, a, new, a new beginning. And then, of course, the visit uh, to Yad Vashem, uh, and, and also the, 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 the preaching of, of, of the Pope there, which was very, very impressive. Uh, and even the Mass in the Cenaculum on Mount Zion, which was, uh, seems, seems uh, almost impossible, went uh, smoothly and peaceful. But <laughs> an hour after the, the, the uh, the Pope left uh, Mount Zion. I was in uh, Mount, Zion, Mount Zion, and there was the Eurasian attack on the Domitian Abbey uh, uh, on Mount Zion. So we can see the both both sides okay, both sides of, of, of the visit, and we can see what happened a, a later a year later the Eurasian attack at the Church of Tabcha uh, near the Sea of Galilee in June uh, 2015, and also you can see the inscription, the Elim Karoti Cartoon, yeah, seeing the Christians as heretics, as, as, as not belonging to, to the land, uh, 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 Salim spoke, spoke about it. Uh, and in two, um, that December 2020, Raison at the Gatsimane uh, uh, Church, uh, the Basilica of Agony in Jerusalem, and uh, you can see from the news a sword close to the investigation told Khan, uh, told Khan, the, the Israeli TV, that uh, during the integration, the uh, uh, integration, Yehoshua uh, uh, Alkobi, a 49 years old Jerusalem resident, told the police, "I wanted, I wanted to burn down the church because the Christians murdered Jews in the Holocaust uh, and in diaspora." I didn't want anyone to be hurt, so, so I tried to set the church on fire when it was empty. Uh, and not only problems with the Jews, also problems in, in Sakhnin, again in uh, December uh, uh, 2020, uh, 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 
charts uh, uh, were, 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 were flied at, at Haifa District uh, Court against uh, uh, two uh, Sakhnin residents. Yeah, they heard a rumor, a, a voice message was released on social media in which a Christian man was heard cursing Muslim circles. And after hearing the recordings, the two men were, were angered and decided to set, to set, to set the, Christmas, the Christmas tree uh, on, on fire. Yeah? And uh, uh, I think uh, Debbie spoke of, about the, the Armenians, yeah, and maybe that we are a little bit close to the Armenians. So, so here you can uh, read about the attacks of uh, young uh, yeshiva boys, uh, maybe around for the round coming from the Jewish quarter, uh, uh, attacking uh, Armenians, uh, youngsters, and, and, and a priest uh, near the, the Armenian quarter. In Jerusalem, and you can see the, that in the in the in the media, in the let's say in the, in the religious uh, national media, they are saying that that Armenians attack the Jews. Yeah, uh, as you see on on the right side, uh, and. Uh, 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 Salim uh, mentioned what happened uh, in May. So here you can see uh, Wadi Abu Nasar uh, with his uh, daughters that were attacked uh, near the house uh, in Haifa. And he, with all his known past uh, and, and, and present as the Catholic, as, as advisor to the Catholic Church and honorary consul of Spain in Haifa, uh, nothing. <laughs> It didn't help him even, even with the police investigation in Haifa during the last, uh, the last trials. Uh, and just uh, this, this October, uh, the 26th of October, uh, the affair in, uh, in Bet Avraham, Avraham House, Maison de Avraham in, 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 in Ras El Amud, uh, there were activity to children and, and adults, cultural activity. Uh, and it was stopped uh, uh, by the police because uh, 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 the assumption was that it's, it's, it is being supported by the Palestinian uh, Authority. So you can see from all sides, you can see problems from the police uh, in Sakhnin and, 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 and really uh, very problematic uh, from, from all sides. Yeah? And even with the evangelicals, yeah? Uh, we, you can see the ambivalence from in, in the in the relations with with the state of Israel. On the one hand, you can see that uh, if you look uh, uh, down on the right side, uh, despite the uh, COVID nineteen uh, travel ban, Israel had seventy evangelical to volunteer in the settlement on the West Bank. But on the other hand, a Christian uh, channel to be removed from hot cable provider. Uh, after targeting the Jews, grave diplomatic incidents, yeah? and, and you can read uh, 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 from the from the people of the of the God of God TV. Uh, we never had the opportunity the opportunity to uh, to broadcast the gospel in Israel in cable TV in Hebrew language. Uh, we can now take the message of Yeshua, uh, uh, our Messiah, to all of Israel, twenty four seven. And you can see the reaction of the Ministry of uh, Communication, uh, David Amsalem. Uh, we would not allow any missionary channel to operate in Israel, uh, uh, not in any time or, or any way. Uh, and there is the problems of uh, who uh, deserves the tax relief. Yeah, uh, 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 the Gaffney. Uh, the chairman of the finance committee at the Knesset, uh, one of his greatest achievements uh, after, his, after years of long uh, struggle, a few months ago, Gaffney convened the Knesset finance committee uh, and prevented tax exemption for Christian missionary uh, NGO in Israel. In response, they petitioned to high court. It's accept, it, it, it accepted the position of the tax authority, which had approved the, the NGO as a public institution that meets the terms of law. That's the tense between democracy and the Jewish state that uh, we can see here very clear. 
And if we, I want uh, something which is a little bit humorous, so you see even, even Rabbi Yitzhak Kaduri, yeah, one of the, one of the great uh, Kabbalists, yeah. Uh, uh, there's all kind of, I, I got this message in my, uh, in my home, yeah. Uh, did, uh, did Kaduri wrote something that Jesus is the Messiah, yeah. So you see the, in many ways, still these two religions have all kinds of, of, of interactions uh, as, as we see here. Or also something which is a little bit funny, <laughs> but not so funny. Uh, there is the church in, 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 Je in Jesh, in, in, in Gush Chalav. There is the, the, what, the, the Masbiran there. Uh, you can hear the history of the church and who approve uh, is a text, Rabbi Yitzhak Basri, yeah? It's kosher uh, from Yitzhak Basri because the authority for developing the holy, the holy sites is there is connection to the uh, ministry uh, had by, uh, by the minister Derry, so he need the approval of the rabbi uh, telling about the church uh, in, in Jesh. Uh, Maybe something more optimistic, the procession in Haifa. I hope that we'll have the procession now without the corona problems, but this is maybe one of the, one of the optimistic events that, that it's became uh, the, the, the procession in Haifa became the, the, the part of the city life and, and, and part of and, and, and all the city, uh, all the uh, residents of the city uh, are taking care in, in, this, in this procession. Uh, and the summary, the summary of the book, yeah, I, I quote uh, Rabbi uh, David Rosen, I, 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 I suppose many of you know him, and he speak about uh, the situation of minority is always profound reflection of the social and moral condition and, and the and moral condition of a, of a society as a whole. The well-being of Christian communities in the Middle East is nothing less than the kind of a barometer of the moral condition of our countries. The degree to which Christian enjoys civil, enjoy civil rights and, 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 and liberties testifies the health uh, uh, of the respective societies in the Middle East. The Jews who for many years were a minority in Muslims and Christian world should, should, should remember this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amnon. I think the words of, um, of Father uh, Rosen actually reflect many things that were said by our, uh, by our speakers. So I would like to thank you and you're welcome to purchase the book or read it online in Hebrew and English. The Hebrew edition is uh, uh, online, the English uh, can, you can purchase and it's in your chat. And you are also uh, welcome to see the question and answers um, in, the, in the chat box, in the Q and A um, box, because there are many questions and they were answered by our speaker during the sessions. Since um, our time is over, we won't have time for questions, but I would just like to, to thank all the speakers. Um, Every time we conclude this evening in the memory of, uh, we do the annual uh, evening in the memory of Daniel, I, I think how he, could in, how he would be happy to sit in the audience uh, or in the panelist and how he would enjoy the content and the discussion um, and he would be interested to, to be involved and to express his opinion. Um, but it, it's good but it's good to know that, that we're here and we continue that work and we do that thanks to um, to my colleagues, which I would like to mention, Dr. Sar Bernstein, the director of the Rossing Center, and John Munaya, who is behind the scene in the range and take care of all our webinars, and and the rest of the staff of the Rossing staff. Um, I would like to talk to thank the Jerusalem Institute for their uh, collaboration on uh, doing this evening, and I would like to thank our distinguished guests and speakers, Mayan Rave. Uh, Reverend uh, Fouad Darer, Dr. Debbie Weissman, Professor Salim Munayer, and Dr. Amnon Ramon. And I would like to thank all of you who participated and listened and asked questions and um, stay involved. Keep following us on Facebook and our website. 
and uh, we will be happy to see you in our future webinars. And I would like to greet the Christian friends who are already in the midst of adv Advent. So happy Advent and happy Christmas. And uh, we're hopefully to celebrate only happy events in, in the Holy Land. Thank you very much. <laughs>